Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today, we're going to be discussing vegetable gardening um, as part of our series for um, Fort Drum soldiers and families, those who live on base and off base. Um, so today, I'm going to go through some a few, you know, basic information that relates to vegetable gardening. Some of these slides you may have seen in our first presentation on basic gardening, but I'm going to go over them again in reference to vegetables. And then we're going to go through and just talk about individual vegetables. Um, we have Jenna Waite on us on with us today from Mountain Community Homes, and she's going to be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, just type them in chat. And um, Jenna, just feel free to, to go ahead and read those questions as they come up and we'll address them while they're hot in people's minds. So let's talk about vegetable gardening. And there's always an issue with this. There we go, okay. So um, there's a couple different ways you can lay out a vegetable garden. Um, you can lay it out in beds or in rows. Um, with beds, you need to follow what's called the two foot rule. Um, basically, the average person can reach about two feet. So if you have a bed or even a row that you can reach from both sides, it can be four feet wide. If it's a row that's up against a fence or the edge of the garden, um, you can only reach two feet. So that should only be two feet wide. So four feet, if you can access it from both sides. Um, with beds, beds are good for um, greens because you can plant them very densely and that provides weed control. Um, for for a, a dense bed, just scatter the seeds and very simple to do. And it's easier with things like lettuce, especially that has very tiny seeds. It's almost impossible to plant lettuce one seed at a time, two inches apart. So just scatter the seeds, lightly cover them with soil, and um, the lettuce will come up, it'll be fine. You don't have to thin or do anything. And then if you're planting in rows, um, with rows, you, you can make them, you know, eight inches wide. And if you have access, access from both sides, it's much easier to access them. Um, when you're making long rows, sometimes it's hard because they're, they're crooked. If you try to make a furrow in the soil, um, that's always my issue. I take a hoe and I, I'm making a long row for whatever I'm planting and it always ends up being crooked, which makes me crazy. But, it, but you know, what, one thing you can do is um, you can put a couple stakes in the ground, one stake at each end of the row, and then tie a string to each stake and suspend it between the two stakes and then when you make your row just run your hoe right along that string that's suspended and that will make your rows a little bit straighter. Um, rows are good for root crops because root crops need a lot of space to grow so you wouldn't want to scatter seeds in a bed like like carrot seeds in a bed because even though carrot seeds are very tiny um, they need space because they need to grow underground you're harvesting the root if you uh, crowd carrots too much, the roots will um, interfere with each other. You'll get all kinds of weird shaped roots and twining and twisting roots. So carrots do need to be thin. So if you're gonna be growing carrots, it's best just to put them in a row. And a lot of people kind of do a combination. They do um, rows within beds. So maybe you'd have a bed of lettuce um, and you'd have maybe four rows within that bed, and that would be just dedicated to lettuce. But like I said, a combination of both is most common. When you uh, plan your vegetable garden, think about placing the plants and think about layout. Um, the tall plants should go on the north or west sides of the garden, and that's because you don't want them to shade out other plants. So if you put them on the north and west side, um, there will be no shading going on. Um, things like tomatoes, asparagus, climbing peas and beans, these are some, plant <laughs> some plants that are likely to get pretty tall. So you'd wanna put them on the north or west sides. Now, if you've already got your garden in and you haven't done that, it's not a big deal. The plants will manage, but ideally um, that's what you should do. 
and here's some examples. I mean, this is a, a commercial field of asparagus, but it shows you how tall these plants do get. And here's some tomatoes, some of the beefsteak tomatoes, they can be five feet tall. And then over here, we've got some climbing beans climbing on some, some poles. And again, these can be six to eight feet tall. Let's talk a little bit about shade. Now, some vegetables actually benefit from shade. So you'd want to put them in the shade of taller plants. Things like spinach and lettuce, um, they tend to stop growing when it gets hot and they die back. But if you can provide them a little bit of shade, you can get a longer season out of those crops. So um, plants that prefer shade, like spinach and lettuce, you could put them um, in the shade of taller plants. So put them on the north side of taller plants, or maybe you have a portion of the garden that's a little bit shady. Maybe in the late afternoon, one end of the garden is, uh, you know, is shaded by some trees. That would be the place for the spinach and lettuce. Let's talk a little bit about companion planting. Um, in your vegetable garden, it's always a good idea to add flowers to attract pollinators because most of the vegetables that you will grow are going to need some sort of pollination. And that's especially true for uh, vine crops like cucumbers and squash, um, zucchini, summer squash, things like that. And the types of flowers that are most attractive to pollinators are flowers that are in the daisy family or the carrot family. And there's an example of something in the carrot family. This is actually dill and it has these yellow flower heads that develop. And it's, um, the flower heads are like an upside down umbrella. They're called an umbel. So anything that has that particular shape to it is, um, is going to be attractive to beneficial and pollinating insects. Um, another one that has a flower like that is cilantro. Flowers can also be added to deter insects. Um, things like marigolds, nasturtium, and, and certain herbs are naturally um, annoying to some of the nastier insects that attack our plants. So if you put those maybe around the perimeter of the garden, something like that, um, it will tamp down maybe some of the bad insects. And here's a good example, um, marigolds just around the perimeter of the garden. Now, if you're planning on growing any perennial crops, um, you need to place them off to the side of the garden um, or even in a separate garden. They need their own place. So things like horseradish, mint, asparagus, rhubarb, strawberries, and perennial herbs, all of those are going to grow year after year after year and they need their own space. The first two, horseradish and mint, have asterisks next to them. They need to go in their own separate garden. They are very, very invasive and they will take over a whole garden in a short period of time. So if you have the desire to grow any one of those, um, give them their own dedicated garden. And there's, there's horseradish, as you can see, it's in its own separate place, it's not near anything else. And obviously they mow around the edges of it and that keeps it in check. Think about wheelbarrows. Um, in a small garden, you should have a, a main path, usually down the center, and make sure it's wide enough so you can, uh, so it can accommodate a wheelbarrow or a cart. Um, you may not think you're gonna use those types of things, but in the future, you may want to. <clears throat> so make that, that center row about three to four feet wide, just so you can get a wheelbarrow down the center. And then you may want additional footpaths that go off the main path. And they can be as little as just one foot wide. They're just big enough so you can get down there to weed, harvest, and, and do any other activities that you need to do to maintain the garden. Another thing you should think about is crop rotation. Um, you need to move your crops from one space to another every year. And, you know, this is a typical cycle that we see that a lot of farmers use, but it's the same thing with vegetable gardens. Um, crop rotation will help with insect control and disease control, and it prevents nutrient depletion. 
if you grow tomatoes in the same spot year after year after year, um, they're going to deplete that area of soil of certain nutrients because tomatoes take a certain select group of nutrients out of the soil. Maybe carrots don't, maybe peppers don't, maybe potatoes don't. But, pota but tomatoes are gonna to take a certain set of nutrients out of the soil. So if you grow them in the same place year after year after year, those nutrients that tomatoes like will be gone after a while and your tomatoes will start to decline. So that's why you need to rotate your crops. And I know that in a small garden, it's sometimes hard to do that, but just do the best that you can. And um, yes, you can add fertilizer and that's gonna add some nutrients back in. But again, disease and insect control um, are also um, a big benefit of crop rotation. Now, a lot of people are curious about what to grow. And up here in Northern New York, we can grow a lot of things. Um, a lot of people that get posted up here think, oh, you know, it's the cold North country. And if you're a gardener, you know, you may be afraid that you can't grow anything. Well, there are a lot of things that you can grow. You just have to recognize that we have a shorter growing season. But the bottom line is grow what you like that, that is, is doable in our area. Um, if you have kids, children love fresh vegetables that they have planted. So if the, if the kids can get in the garden and they can have some, uh, their own tomato plant or some autonomy, maybe a small corn, corner of the garden, and they can help with planting and help with harvest, they are more likely to be open about eating fresh vegetables and other new foods. And try something new every year. You know, initially, if you're a beginner, we're, you know, we suggest that you start with easy things because we want you to be successful. But once you get going and you like it, um, be adventurous. Try some different things every year and see how they do. I do that every year. And a lot of times the things I grow, they just don't do well. So I don't grow them again. Sometimes I have a lot of success. One thing I've had some success with are um, Asian greens that tend to grow really well. And I, my, um, my son-in-law actually brought me some seeds from China. He's, he's a native of Hong Kong. And he actually brought me some um, Asian green seeds uh, one year when he went back home to visit. And um, they did really, really well. And every, every year since then, I grow them because they, they work so well. Um, so for you beginners, we want you to grow easy crops. Um, yeah, there's probably a lot of things that you want to grow and they can be very difficult. So if you're just starting out, start with some easy things so you can be successful. So from seeds, any of the greens are going to do well. Um, things like linnet, uh, lettuce, spinach, Swiss chard, and kale are all very easy. Um, peas, beets, bush green beans, carrots, and radish, again, very simple. If you're putting in some transplants, tomatoes, um, hot or frying peppers, bell peppers are kind of hard to grow because we don't get a lot of heat up here. And that's what bell peppers prefer. They really like warm nights and a lot of heat. So you, you, you'll get bell peppers. You just won't get a huge crop. Um, zucchini is easy. You can grow that from seed. Um, also the same with cucumbers. You can either use transplants or seeds and they are relatively simple to grow. Um, you may wanna grow things that are expensive to buy in the store or maybe things that are difficult to obtain. Um, the, a lot of times the garlic that is sold in stores, um, the, the cloves that you buy when you start taking them apart, they're made up of these little tiny garlic cloves. And, and the deeper you get into the clove of garlic, the smaller they get. And as far as I'm concerned, they're a pain to deal with. Um, if you grow your own garlic, you can grow hardneck garlic, which is, which is what grows really well up here. Um, and the cloves are big, you know, they're, they're really nice big cloves, easy to work with. Um, leeks are expensive, um, sometimes hard to find. There may be certain herbs um, that you prefer that you can't find in the grocery store. 
You may like heirloom tomatoes and they do grow heirloom tomatoes in the store, but probably not, you know, some of the, some of the older varieties that, that people prefer and Asian greens and ethnic varieties. There, there are a lot of um, crops that people use for cultural cooking and many of them can be grown up here. Obviously this is not a tropical environment so we can't grow everything, but there are a lot of um, Asian and ethnic varieties that we can grow. Um, and you can just contact me and um, I, we can figure out you know, what's going to do well up here. You may wanna grow things that are high in nutrition. Um, a lot of people who start their own vegetable gardens, this is one of the main reasons why they do it because they want to get a little bit more nutrition into their diets. So sweet potatoes, kale, broccoli, pepper, carrot, these are um, the big powerhouses as far as nutrition goes. Now, Things that are high maintenance or difficult to grow, um, I don't recommend for beginners. Um, and here's a quick list. Um, broccoli and cauliflower, they're very difficult to grow because it's a timing issue. If you don't get them in at the exact right time, you don't, really don't get any heads on them. Another issue with them is um, the, squash, um, the squash vine caterpillar. Um, it gets into the heads and it, it eats the heads and you know and it and the color of this thing blends right in with the leaves you can't even see that it's there and on broccoli you can't even see it on the head and i don't know how many times i've uh, harvested broccoli thinking i got all the caterpillars off of it i've even brought it inside soaked it in salt pulled more caterpillars off of it and then i cook it and guess what's floating on top of the pot more caterpillars. Um, so between those two things, I don't even bother growing them anymore. Um, watermelon is difficult because it likes a lot of heat. The same thing goes for cantaloupe and honeydew. If you want to grow any of the types of melons, I would recommend that you put down black landscape fabric and plant them in the fabric. That way the soil is heated up and the air surrounding the plant is heated up. And sometimes you can get a decent crop doing that. Another thing that's difficult to grow is celery. Um, it, if you don't give it enough water, it tends to be really tough. Um, and I've grown it before, but I, I honestly, I don't see the point because how much celery you know, can a person possibly use? There aren't a lot of ways to preserve it. I have frozen it in the past to use in stews and in soups, and, and it works well that way. But, you know, a head of celery in the grocery store is a couple dollars, so I don't bother with that one anymore either. So, um, so if you're gonna be planting, um, you need to obtain seeds and plants. And there are different types of seeds out there. They're just plain old regular seeds. There are, are organic seeds, and organic means that they have the seeds have been harvested from plants where no pesticide has been used. There are non-GMO seeds, so seeds that haven't been genetically modified. There are hybrid seeds that are a cross um, between two, um, two parents. They're crossed to uh, bring up a child that will have certain characteristics. There are open pollinated seeds, which um, you can save the seeds from these particular plants year after year. And then there are heirloom seeds, and these are seeds that have been brought down over generations that families have saved, um, very popular right now. Most heirloom seeds are open pollinated. So once you obtain them, you can collect the seeds and you'll have them year after year. So there's, there's just a quick explanation of the different types of seeds. Um, you can get seeds from catalogs, online, um, the big box stores. DePoville Library has a seed exchange that, that's very good. So um, if there's um, any certain seeds you're looking for that you can't find right now, I would go up and check with them. And just a little FYI, the cheaper the seed pack, uh, 
the less quality control there is. So you may see in the hardware store, you know, seeds that are 10 for a dollar or something like that. Usually those seeds, uh, a lot of times they, they don't do very well. Um, and you may not get what's on the front of the package. It may say one thing and you may end up with another. Um, you may have some weed seeds in there. So you don't have to buy the most expensive seeds, but just try to avoid those ones that, um, that are super cheap. So let's talk a little bit about transplants. Um, up here in Northern New York, we have to do a little shortcut because our growing season isn't long enough to put a seed in the ground for certain crops and have it mature before we get a frost. So what happens is we start seeds indoors in greenhouses and you know they start them in like end of March into April and then that kind of gives us a shortcut. We, we actually use the plants and put those in the garden um, and that kind of shortens up our, gives us a little more length to our season so that we can get those crops to mature. So things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and some of the herbs um, you have to buy as transplants. You cannot put a tomato seed in the ground and get a tomato plant. There's just not enough time. Um, and some, um, some perennial crops also need to be transplanted. Um, things like horseradish and asparagus, you actually purchase roots that you plant. Um, and the plants are available at garden stores, big box stores. And if you, in the future, if you really get into this, you can start your own seeds inside. But this is not for beginners. This takes a lot of work. This is not something you can just do on a windowsill um, because there's not enough light. Um, you, need, you need lights, you need a stand, you need containers, and, and it is a, a lot of work. So um, for now, if you're a beginner, just purchase your plants at your local uh, garden store. So now let's go in and talk about some individual crops. First, I wanna talk about what are called cool season crops. And here in Northern New York, um, we kind of divide our crops into two categories, warm season and cool season. Cool season crops are planted from seeds. So things like lettuce, spinach, kale, peas, beets, carrots, radish, onion sets, or plants. These are all what we call cool season crops. These can be planted as early as mid-April, as long as the ground is, is dried out and, and not frozen. These particular um, crops are not bothered by cold or frost. As you can see in the picture on the right, they can even be snowed upon and it does not bother them because they like the cool weather. What they do is they produce early in the season and then when it gets warm towards the end of June, they stop producing. They, they go to seed, they send up a flower stalk, and then they're done uh, because they don't like hot weather. Um, the exception is carrots. Carrots, um, they just continue producing throughout the season, but they can be planted really early. And then obviously you, you harvest them in the fall. What's nice about the cool season crops is you can do what's called double cropping. You can get two crops, out of these in one season. So you do a crop in the, in the early spring and then you can replant them in late August for a fall crop because again in late August temperatures are cooling down and these plants do really well. So you can have these all over again at the end of the summer. Now the warm season crops are kind of just the opposite. Um, some of them are grown from seed and you cannot put them in the ground until around May 15th. Now that's just an approximate date. It's really going to depend on the weather. If the weather's cool, wait till later in the month. Um, so things like green beans, cucumber, zucchini, winter squash, all of those need warm soil temperatures in order for the seeds to germinate. Some of them need soil temperatures that are around 70 degrees. And we really don't hit that till the middle of May or the end of May. 
Now, contrast that with those cool season seed crops that we just talked about. Some of those will germinate at soil temperatures as low as 40 degrees. So um, warm season crops, don't be in a rush to get these in. Um, and then there are other warm season crops that we plant as transplants. And th th those are those um, things that we need to start indoors. Um, tomato, pepper, cucumber, zucchini, winter squash. And these you usually put in the ground in late May to early June. Um, up here, Memorial Day is the big, Memorial Day weekend is the big weekend when people put in their transplants and, and get their gardens in. Um, and sometimes this year, for example, it was cold. Memorial Day was cold. Um, and we had had cold temperatures up, up until then. And Memorial Day was early. So actually, if you had waited another week, more towards the beginning of June, actually this year it would have been better to put those in a little bit later. So don't be in a big hurry to get stuff in. Um, you have plenty of time, even if it's the first couple weeks in June and you haven't gotten some things in yet, you still have time. Now these warm season crops, cold temperatures will kill them. Um, and you'll see on the packets or on the tags, it'll say set out or plant after all danger of frost has passed. And this is why we go for that Memorial Day weekend because usually by the end of May throughout Jefferson County into St. Lawrence and Lewis County, usually by then there's very little chance that we're going to have a frost. Now, that being said, you don't have to get as cold as a frost to damage these plants. Um, some of them can be damaged at 50 degrees with just a cold wind. Um, plants that are especially sensitive are members of the cucurbit family. So cucumbers, melons, winter squash, summer squash, all of those are very sensitive to cold. So if you don't get those in until June 1st, that's fine. You still have plenty of time to get a crop in. Now, if you have plants out there and you know, you've done everything right, you've watched the weather, you've planted them at the appropriate time, and uh-oh, they call for a frost. The weather guy says that there is an Arctic cold front or some wacky thing. You don't need to panic. All you need to do is go out and cover those plants. Put an old sheet over them or an old blanket. Um, you can even take um, plastic containers and set them over the tops of the, the plants. And that's enough protection um, to keep them safe in a light late spring frost. And here's just a map of our frost dates here in Northern New York. And if you look at the, uh, the one on the left that's labeled last spring frost, you can see that for most of the county, by May 30th, uh, we're pretty much done with our frosts. So that's why we have that Memorial Day weekend date for those warm season crops. And you also need to pay attention to the first fall frost because, um, you know, depending, as you can see from the map, depending where you are in the county, um, if you're in the western portions of the county, um, that frost comes a little bit earlier if you're more inland or it comes a little bit later um, in, the east, in the western part of the county. So areas like Clayton, Alex Bay, um, Sackett's Harbor, those areas, you're gonna have a little bit longer growing season because you're closer to the water. As you move inland and head east, the frost dates become early. And the reason you wanna pay attention to this is because a lot of times you, you may ha still have fruit on your plant. You may still have tomatoes out there, peppers, um, some squash, and you wanna make sure you harvest them before they get hit with the frost. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about individual crops. Um, go, we'll go back to the cool season crops. Um, again, the seeds germinate at low soil temperatures. They can usually be planted as soon as the ground can be worked in the spring. They tolerate frost and snow, but when the weather gets warm, they tend to bolt, which means they go to, they go to seed. And if they're a, 
uh, a leafy crop, like spinach or lettuce, the leaves will become bitter and you don't want to eat them after that point. These can be planted in the spring or the fall. So let's go through and talk about individual crops. Um, asparagus is a cool season crop, but it's a perennial. It's grown from roots or crowns that you plant. Um, you cannot harvest them for three years. So for those of you who are just up here for a couple years, don't bother planting asparagus because you won't get anything out of it. You have to wait three years for it to establish a good root system before you can start harvesting the spears. Um, so harvest, uh, asparagus tolerates dry and, and salty conditions, prefers a pH of around seven. And asparagus has male and female plants. And if you're going to plant any, make sure you get male plants and it will tell you that in the information that you, that you get because male plants aren't going to produce fruit. Therefore, all of their energy is going to go into producing spears, so you get a, a better crop yield. If you do decide to plant asparagus, make sure you, are, um, you keep up on your weed control. Um, one of the things that really destroys asparagus beds is that too many weeds develop and the, and the bed just kind of declines. So be really, really good at your weed control if you're going to grow asparagus. The next cool season crop are beets. They, they don't need a super rich soil to grow in. They, they do well in poor soils. Um, the biggest issue the beets have is they, they use a lot of boron in the soil. And um, sometimes if your beets aren't doing well, they may need a little bit more boron. And the easiest thing you can do is to get some 20 mule team borax and add that to the soil. And that will help with the boron issues. If you excuse me for one minute, my phone line is, is going off. Hello, this is Sue. I've got your phone number. I'm going to call you back because I'm on a webinar right now, okay? Okay, I'm back. Okay, um, so beets, they like cool conditions. They like a lot of sun. And when you plant a beet seed, actually what you're planting is a seed ball. Um, it's about the size of a BB, but within that, that seed ball are a bunch of little seeds. So when the beets come up, they'll come up in a little clump. And you have to thin them. Otherwise, the, um, the beet on the bottom will not develop. So what I do is um, when I thin my beets is I wait till they get about eight inches tall and then I thin them because you can use the tops that you've thinned, the portions that you pull out, you can use those and cook them as beet greens. So then you're not really um, wasting anything. You can also buy beets as pelleted seeds where you get, you get one seed inside a clay coated um, pebble. And so those are a little bit easier because you can space them out and you don't have to worry about thinning. Beets, depending on what you're going to use them for, um, should be planted in succession. So plant a row one week and then maybe a week later plant another row. That way your beets aren't ripe all at once. Um, sometimes if think things ripen all at once, you can't use them up quickly. But if you're using your beets maybe to make pickled beets, maybe you want them to all develop at the same time so you can do all your pickling at once. So decide what, you're going, what the end use is for some of these things and that will determine whether you want to do a succession planting or whether you want them to all be harvested at once. Broccoli, we talked about this. It can be planted as a spring or fall crop. Um, but like I said, there are a lot of issues with it. Um, it needs a lot of moisture. Um, you need to space the plants relatively far apart, about two feet apart, to develop good heads. Um, it does not do well if it gets a lot of nitrogen. It's one of those plants that, that really doesn't like um, a lot of nitrogen. So you don't want to fertilize it too much. It also has a shallow root system, so you have to be careful 
when you are weeding around it or doing any type of hoeing because you, it's easy to disturb the roots. And then again, there's all the issues with timing, getting it in the ground, and then the, um, the um, insects, the caterpillars that get into the heads and, and create problems. Brussels sprouts. Now, Brussels sprouts is a weird one. It's a cool season crop, but you plant it as a transplant in mid-June to July. And the reason for this is, is because you harvest the sprouts in the fall, in December, um, up, up to December. Brussels sprouts will go um, into December. You can continue harvesting right through the snow because it is a cold season crop. And the reason we do this, the reason we plant it late is because you actually want the sprouts to be exposed to cold temperatures. The cold makes the Brussels sprouts sweeter. If there's anybody out there who absolutely hates Brussels sprouts, it's probably because you haven't had any that have been frosted. Um, before they get frosted, they are. They're, they're kind of bitter, kind of nasty, nasty tasting. But once they get hit with a frost, um, because of the way the hormones and sugars are distributed in the plant, they develop a sweeter flavor. So if you don't like Brussels sprouts, try to see if you can get some later in the season that have been frosted. They'll probably taste a lot better. Cabbage um, is relatively easy to grow, um, but it's kind of like broccoli. It's a timing issue. You can grow a spring crop for summer use, or you can grow a um, crop that matures in the fall that's a storage crop that you would keep over the winter. One thing that happens with cabbage a lot is if it gets too much moisture, the heads will split. They'll crack in half. And then you get insects in there and some disease issues. Um, again, like other plants in the brassica or cabbage family, it does have a shallow root system. This is another one. Um, there, there's an insect called um, a cabbage worm that again will feed on the heads um, it's the same one that attacks broccoli and cauliflower. So for that reason, this one is a little bit more problematic to grow. And as I'm saying this, as I'm talking about some of these insects that um, bother plants, you can certainly control and control these insects. You, there are a lot of insecticides out there that work really well. Um, I don't go into a lot of detail on that because I find that most people who are growing their own vegetables do not want to use insecticides. In fact, that's the main reason why they grow their own vegetables. They want organic products. But if you do um, want to use an insecticide, if you're having a problem, whether, either, whether it's a disease or an insect, just let me know and I can give you the names of, of products that work really well. There are also organic controls for some of these insects. Um, they don't work as well as a pesticide but a lot of times they work well enough so you can get a decent crop. So again, just contact me for details. Carrots. Um, carrots have very tiny seeds and they are super slow to germinate. Um, you will look at your row of carrots for a good two weeks and wonder what you did wrong. They are just very slow to germinate and they grow very slowly. Um, what a lot of people do is when they plant their carrots, they interplant them with radishes um, because the radishes will come up and be done within 25 days. And it's a good way to mark the row so you know where the carrots are because uh, a lot of times because they take so long, you may have forget exactly where you put them. Um, Obviously with growing carrots, you want a very loose, almost a sandy type soil because that makes harvest a lot easier. And it makes it easier for the roots to develop and penetrate into the soil. You do have to thin the carrots. Like I said, the seeds are very small. So you're gonna to wanna to thin them to about three inches apart. You can also buy those pelletized seeds, which are about the size of a BB, and it's a lot easier to individually space those. Um, again, doesn't like a lot of nitrogen, and you can also do some succession planting with this so that they mature at different times, or if you're going to do any like canning or freezing, 
maybe you want them to all come into harvest at one time so you can do your preservation all at once. Cauliflower, you know, this is even harder than broccoli. Um, I wouldn't recommend beginners grow this, although there are some really cool cauliflower varieties that they've developed now. There are purple-headed ones, there are green-headed ones, orange-headed ones, and they're, they're very interesting looking, but um, if you're going to grow cauliflower, it's probably best to use transplants, um, and if they get too much heat or too much sun, they develop what's called racy heads. The heads just tend to kind of crumble and don't hold together. So again, cauliflower, not for beginners. We talked about celery. Um, again, this is difficult to grow. It needs a lot of fertilizer, lots of water. And if you don't grow it correctly, the, uh, the stems tend to be very, very tough and even difficult to chew. But if for some reason you do grow it and you are successful, um, you could freeze celery, like I said, and it's suitable for use like in stews and soups. Lettuce, super easy to grow. Um, very adaptable for container growing. Everybody should be growing lettuce. Um, if you go in the store, lettuce can be kind of expensive. Iceberg lettuce has absolutely no nutritional value. We cannot grow iceberg lettuce up here. Everybody should be growing some sort of leaf lettuce. It's very nutritious. Um, there's all kinds of leaf shapes and colors. There's leaf lettuce, there's romaine lettuce, there's butterhead lettuce. All of those are simple to grow. One thing you need to keep in mind is lettuce seeds need light to germinate. So when you scatter them, you want to cover them very, very lightly. So scatter the seeds, then pat them down against the soil, and then maybe just take a little bit of soil and just sprinkle it over the top. Um, that way um, the seeds will get light and they'll germinate a lot better. Um, lettuce should be planted as a succession planting. So maybe every week, every two weeks, put some more seeds in because really lettuce, you have to use it as it develops because there's really no way to preserve it. So you may wanna do the succession plantings just so you don't waste any. And lettuce again is one of those crops that benefits from some shading. Um, if you can give it some shade like now and later this week when it's supposed to be like 90, it's going to extend the time um, before that crop wants to go to seed. Onions. Um, Onions can be grown from seeds, from onion sets, or plants. Now, if you're going to grow onions from seed, you need to start the seeds in February inside. Um, they're very slow to germinate. So you're better off just buying onion plants or onion sets. And an onion set is a little tiny onion bulb, about the size of a quarter, but, but round. And those are what you plant, um, and they, are, they work very well, as do onion plants. Um, Onions are easy to grow. They do have a shallow root system, so you need to be careful when you are doing any type of uh, hoeing or digging around in the soil. And um, you can grow them as scallions, use them in this stage here that's shown in the photo, or you can let the bulbs mature and they can be stored. And some onions, depending on the variety that you, can, that you get, will store through the winter and into spring. And if that's your intention, make sure you get a variety that's called a storage onion and it will, it will last for a long period of time. Peas, um, again, we're in that cool season crop. You can start these super early. Um, you can do a spring crop and a fall crop. Keep in mind that there are different types of peas. There are bush peas and vining peas. Bush peas tend to stay small. Um, the vining types, they want to climb, so you need to provide them with some sort of trellis. Um, and what's nice about peas and a lot of these other um, early season crops is once they are done producing, you can pull them out and you can follow them with one of the warm season crops. And one of the things I do is when, when my peas are done, um, I take them out and I plant beans right in the same spot. 
um, because beans are pretty short and you have plenty of time to get a crop. So that way I'm getting some um, double crop, cropping going on and I'm not just having my, my soil sit idle. Um, you want to avoid um, overhead watering when the peas are flowering because that can damage the flowers and you might not get as many pods. Um, again, there are different types of peas. Um, you can get the, um, the sugar snap peas where you eat the entire pod or you can get the regular shelling peas. There are also Asian varieties for pea sprouts. So, you know, the best thing to do is to get a seed catalog um, and look through it in late winter and, and determine what you want to grow. And most seed companies are going to have all the different varieties um, that you might be interested in. Potatoes. Um, potatoes are easy to grow, but they need an acidic soil. And here in Jefferson County, we don't have a lot of acidic soils. That's why you don't see a lot of potato farms around here. Um, but we can grow them. Um, if you grow them in a soil that is not sufficiently acidic, they will develop a problem called potato scab. And this develops, you've probably seen it on the outside of the potato, it just looks kind of scabby um, and it's not very attractive. Now, if you want to grow potatoes and maybe you, you don't have an acidic soil, pick varieties that are resistant to potato scab and sometimes you can get a good crop. Um, with potatoes, you actually plant a little mini potato or a portion of a potato with some eyes on it. Um, basically dig a trench, plant the, um, the seed potato or the piece in the soil, bury it about two inches. Um, and then when the plants get about eight inches tall, you're going to hill them which means you're gonna cover them with soil, um, cover the lower part of the stem with soil, um, and that allows the tubers to develop, and you may have to hill them two times. And the reason you have to cover them with soil is because if the tubers get exposed to sunlight, they'll turn green, and green potatoes are actually poisonous. So you wanna make sure you do a good job with hilling, and some people, um, instead of using soil to hill, they, they'll cover the um, plants with straw. As you can see, that's what they've done in this picture. And that also does a good job to prevent the greening of the potatoes. Um, potatoes are, you can harvest after the plants die back, or you can do it before the plants have died back. It really doesn't make much difference. It just depends on what size tuber you want. If you relish those new potatoes, you can kind of sneak in dig underneath an existing healthy plant and see what size the tubers are. If they're of size that you want, you can just sneak them right out of there, cover the plant back up and, and let it continue on. Spinach, again, this is another easy one to grow. Obviously we know how nutritious it is. Um, there are different types of spinach. Um, they have what are called savoid types. And that's what this is over here. Savoid means wrinkled. So you've got the very wrinkled leaves. And then there are flat leaf types. Um, I prefer the flat leaf type because I think they're easier to wash the soil off of after harvest. Um, but spinach should be done in succession because again, there really isn't a lot you can do with spinach as far as preservation goes. And maybe you can only eat so much at any one time. Um, I have had success with freezing spinach. Um, it's probably not that exciting. It's about as exciting as frozen spinach that you would buy in your grocery, grocery store, but it does work. Um, again, this is another one where you don't want to give it a lot of fertilizer because if you do, um, you're going to cause it to go to seed even earlier. And this is another one of those um, ones that, that will send up a flower stalk. It will send up um, uh, and the, well, set up a flower stalk when the weather gets hot. And at that point, the leaves will become bitter and inedible. Okay, so that's the end of those cool season crops. Now we're going to talk about the warm season crops. Now, um, at this point where we are right now in today's world, 
it's probably too late for you to put in any of those cool season crops. Um, think about them at the end of summer um, because we're going to be entering the hot period and none of them are going to do very well at all at this point. So think of them in late August into September, but the warm season crops, you still have a window to get these in. Um, they like warm soil, they like warm weather, they will be damaged by frost and cold. Um, some are planted from seeds, some are planted from transplants, um, usually planted in late May, but we're only in the second week of June now, so you have plenty of time if you want to try some of these. Um, and some of them will benefit, benefit from being planted in black plastic mulch. So bush beans, um, these are super easy to grow. You don't need any type of trellis. They come in different colors, which is fun for kids. Um, the traditional green, there are yellow ones and purple ones. Um, they tend to stay small. Um, you can buy, you can grow them as snap beans where you just cook the green beans or you can grow them as shell beans where you let the bean pod mature and you harvest the seed from the pod um, and that, that then you can dry those and store them for, you know, baked beans or, or whatever during the winter time. Um, these should only be direct seeded. Um, you, you would never transplant bush beans because they would not do very well. Again, um, if, you're, if you want to do succession planting, it's a good idea. But if you do, if you can your beans, maybe you make dilly beans, maybe you freeze them, um, plant them all at once so everything is ready to harvest at once. And these are the crop that when my cool season guys die back, I'll fill that space with some bush beans. Now, we, some of you may be familiar with pole beans. Um, pole beans are climbing beans, and if you provide them some sort of trellis um, to climb on, they're going to yield two to three times more than bush beans because you're going up and you can take advantage of that upward space. Um, put the support in before you plant them. It's going to be much easier. So add your trellis and then put your seeds in the ground. Um, and in general, you want to plant about four to six seeds in an area, uh, maybe at the base of each post or pole, and then thin them to probably about two to three seeds. Sweet corn. Um, okay, here's my spiel on sweet corn. Don't even bother. Unless you have an area that's at least 50 by 50 that you're going to plant solid with sweet corn, it's not even worth it. Um, sweet corn needs to cross pollinate. And if you just put in a row of sweet corn, you're not going to get anything. Um, sweet corn is, um, it's very um, hungry for nutrients. It requires a lot of nutrition to get a good crop. Um, and you need, like I said, you need to plant a lot of it. And as far as the bang for the buck, as far as the nutrition level, um, the nutrition level isn't that great for all the work that has to go into it and how much space you need. What I tell everybody is if you want sweet corn, drive down the road. Um, in August up here, there are corn stands on every corner if you drive out into the country. So um, unless you have a large area, I wouldn't even bother with this one. Cucumbers, um, super easy. As you know, there's a lot of things you can do with them. Um, there are different types of cucumbers. There are pickling cucumbers. There are slicing cucumbers, and they can be used interchangeably. Um, they really like the warm weather. Um, cool winds will kill them. So um, if you're having trouble with cucumbers, you might want to try growing them in black plastic mulch. There are vining and bush varieties. So obviously if you have a vining one, you should give it something to climb on. Um, if you do grow these from transplants and you transplant them into the garden, be careful with the roots. Um, cucumbers don't like, like their roots being tampered with. 
Um, so if you're using transplants, be very gentle when you put them in the ground. Um, otherwise, just grow them from seed. It's, it's a lot easier. Um, cucumber plants have male and female flowers. Only the female flowers will develop fruit. Um, and you can tell the male and the female from each other if you look at the base of the flower. The female flower is at the base where it attaches to the stem. There will be a little tiny cucumber there. And if that gets pollinated, then it will develop into a full cucumber. So a lot of times people will get very excited early in the season because their cucumbers have a lot of flowers. And then they call me and say, well, my flowers are dropping off and I'm not getting any fruit. And that's because early in the season, the plants produce mostly male flowers. And the male flowers aren't going to, to uh, produce any fruit. So just keep that in mind. Um, and again, these are insect pollinated. So um, cucumbers, this might be a crop where you want to interplant some of those plants in the daisy family or the carrot family to attract pollinators. Melons, um, again, they like a lot of heat. If you're gonna grow these, put down some black plastic mulch, cut a hole in it and put the seeds or the transplants in and you can see that's what they've done here. There's some black plastic underneath this. Um, you should go with what are called shorter season varieties. Um, anything that's going to mature in less than 100 days is the way to go because anything longer than that, um, because our growing season is so short, you might not get a crop. They need some fertilizer, um, their roots are sensitive, and they need plenty of water. So this is going to be a little bit more of a high maintenance crop than some of the others I've talked about. I have grown melons successfully. I don't get a lot of them. But the only way I've been successful is to plant them in black plaster. Peppers. Um, like I said earlier, bell peppers are, are hard to grow. You, you're not going to get a huge crop. You will get some. Um, they love warm weather. Um, they like evenings, nighttime temperatures that are above 70 degrees. And here in Northern New York, we don't really get that very often. So that's one of the reasons why bell peppers are a little bit harder to grow. But um, frying peppers, cubanelles, hot peppers, they all do really well. Just make sure you give the plants a lot of moisture. Um, and again, don't give them too much nitrogen because um, that can lead to a lot of leafy growth, but no reproductive or fruit growth. Pumpkins, again, um, these, if you're going to grow these, grow varieties that mature within 100 days. They can be transplanted or direct seeded. They do need a lot of moisture. And again, I would recommend planting these in black plastic mulch for the best, um, for, the, for the most success. Summer squash. So now we're talking about zucchini. We're talking about the yellow crookneck squash. Um, if you've ever grown these before, you know that you only need one plant because um, otherwise you're going to be leaving them on your neighbor's doorsteps and your neighbors will be hiding when they see you coming with more zucchini. So depending on what your family size is, um, one or two plants is probably all you need. Um, they also have male and female flowers, so the male flowers aren't going to produce fruit. And you can tell the different flowers again by looking at the base of the flower where it attaches to the stem. If you see a little mini uh, summer squash there, that's a female flower. So this is another one that benefits from having some, some um, flowers planted near it to draw in pollinators. Tomatoes is everybody's favorite, um, can only be grown up here from transplants. Um, if you're going to grow tomatoes, they probably are gonna need some staking or caging. So make sure you put the stake or the cage in at the same time that you put the transplant in the ground. If you try to put the cages in or the stakes in after that, you're gonna disturb the roots, you have a chance of breaking the plants and it's a lot more difficult. So any trellising, staking should be done at planting time. There are two different types of tomatoes. 
determinant and indeterminate. And it will tell you this either in the seed catalog, it'll say it on the seed package, or it'll be on the little tag that's in the package of plants that you buy. Indeterminate tomatoes get very large. They are 100% going to need some sort of staking or trellising. Some of these will get as tall as four or five feet. And what these plants do is they start producing a crop and they continue to consistently produce a crop until the frost kills them. So with indeterminate tomatoes, you're gonna to have a constant harvest throughout the season. Um, indeterminate or determinate tomatoes, on the other hand, are a little bit different. They stay smaller. Um, you may be able to get away with not trellising them. And basically, what these guys do is they produce a compact crop um, over four or five weeks, and then they're done. They stop producing. So depending on what your end use is for the tomatoes, um, if you're going to be doing canning and freezing, you may want to grow determinant varieties so that they produce all at once and you can do, do your stuff and get it done. Um, I grow both types because I do do canning and freezing. So I have some that come into fruit all at once and then I do my canning and then I have the indeterminate ones that I'm growing and I'm not only adding those to the canning, but they're giving me a consistent crop for salads and fresh eating throughout the season. Um, tomatoes can develop a lot of problems. One of them is blossom end rot, where you get a uh, black spot on the bottom of the tomato. And that's usually caused by inconsistent moisture. Tomato plants need a lot of moisture. So to avoid blossom end rot, one thing you can do is just to make sure that you, the plants are getting that one inch of soil a week don't let the soil completely dry out. Make sure it's consistently moist. And again, when we say consistently moist, we mean the moisture of a wrung out sponge. We, you never want to make the soil soggy or wet because that's going to kill the plants. And then again, watermelon. Again, that's the same as the cantaloupes. Um, those types of melons should be planted in black plastic. Go with the short season varieties. And um, this is another one where you have to be really consistent about the moisture um, because it does, and we'll think of a watermelon, it's mostly water. So you're gonna make sure that you're consistent with your watering. Okay, winter squash. Again, there are different varieties. There's butternut, there's buttercup, there's spaghetti squash, um, there's turban squashes, acorn squash. Um, and you can get what are called bush varieties of these. And what a bush variety is, it's, it's just going to take up less space. So if you have a smaller garden and you want to grow winter squash, make sure you get the bush varieties. Um, if you don't, winter squash tends to just sprawl all over the place and get very large. Um, and if, if you don't have room for that, if you don't want to deal with it, the bush varieties are the way to go. Um, there is a problem with squashes called the squash vine borer. It's an insect that kind of drills into the base of the plants, lays its eggs, and then you have these caterpillars eating the insides of the stems, um, eventually causing the plants to die back. If you see this happening, just let me know. It's very, very difficult to control. Um, if you've had problems with this in the past, grow butternut squash. For some reason, the squash vine borers will not attack butternut squash. They'll attack all the other types, but not that particular type. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about water. We, you know, we talked about this earlier. You want an inch of water per week. That's a rule of thumb. Use a rain gauge to make sure you're getting enough water. You should water early in the day before 10 a.m. and avoid wetting the leaves. Try to water at the base of the plants. Drip irrigation is best, but if your only option is a sprinkler or a spray, make sure you do it as early in the day as possible. And you wanna avoid light sprinklings. You wanna make sure when you water that it penetrates down into the soil to encourage the roots to grow down into the soil rather than stay at the surface. Weeds, um, we talked about this, have a plan, 
make it a daily chore, especially early in the season. Keep up on those weeds. Weed, um, weed issues are one of the biggest reasons why people give up on gardens. So you have to do it every day. Use mulch. Mulch is going to make your life a lot easier. Take advantage of it. It's going to lessen the amount of weeding you have to do. Um, you can use bag mulch. You can use leaves or grass clippings. Use straw, not hay. Cardboard and newspaper are free. Those make good mulches. Or if you want to purchase the plastic mulch, that works just as well also. Don't allow any weeds in the garden to go to seed because that's going to be your crop of weeds for next season. And a lot of times for some of these crops, we talked about dense planting for some of the greens. Um, that will naturally um, shade out any weeds that want to come up. And the bottom line is you're going to have to do some weeding. Even if you use mulch, you're going to have to weed immediately around the plants and in some areas. So be prepared to do that and have a plan. Fertilization, if you are an organic gardener, um, there are a couple options. Um, if you've added organic matter like peat moss, compost, or manure to the soil, that's going to add um, low nutrient amounts, plus it's going to add micronutrients and microorganisms that benefit the soil. Um, an organic option is fish emulsion. Um, you mix it up and you feed the plants every two weeks. If you're not too worried about being organic, you can use Osmocote, which is a granular fertilizer. You put it down at the beginning of the season and it feeds for the whole season. Or you can use a water-soluble fertilizer, something like miracle Grow. Again, you would use it every two weeks. Um, and if you've used any of the bagged garden soils um, to fill a raised bed or added it to your garden, um, be careful because a lot of times those bagged soils um, contain fertilizer. And if they do, you don't have to add anything else. Um, if you add fertilizer on top of that, it can create a lot of problems in the garden because it is possible to over fertilize. So if you've added any, any type of amendment that has, has fertilizer already in it, you don't need to do anything else. And if you're putting in any transplants, immediately after planting, water them with either fish emulsion or miracle Grow, And this is regardless of any um, nutrients that are already in any soils that you've added. Because what that does is it, it helps with transplant shock. It helps those transplants become um, established quicker and prevents a lot of wilting and issues. So just the one-time uh, application of fish emulsion or miracle Grow will help those transplants a lot. And here's some examples. Um, on the left is the miracle Grow. These are the little BB type pellets. And then you've got the water-soluble fertilizers, um, miracle Grow or um, fish emulsion. Now, you're going to have some problems in the garden. Um, you may develop some pest issues. Um, have a plan. If you have critters that you know that come to your yard, the big one is deer. Um, if you have deer frequenting your yard, you're going to have to fence in the garden. Because if they're used to coming there, they're going to continue to come and then they see that you've put out this lovely smorgasbord for them, um, they can decimate a garden pretty quickly. So with deer, you need to use a fence or a product called liquid fence. It's a liquid spray that you can spray around the perimeter of the garden and it smells like rotten eggs. And that particular smell is the most offensive to deer. And it works really well. It is expensive and you have to reapply it every time it rains. But um, I've recommended it for years and years and no one has told me that it does not work. Um, if you have mice, squirrels, or chipmunk, these are impossible to control because they can climb, they can get in anywhere. Um, so I guess the best advice for these are have a heart traps, trap them and um, dispatch them or you know whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, same way with woodchuck and rabbits, um, a fence will work for these guys because they can't climb, but you have to bury the base of the fence because they will tunnel underneath it. 
you're having problems with birds, and birds aren't usually an issue unless you're growing berries, um, but you can put by some netting that you can put over the tops of the plants that deters them. Um, a lot of times if you live in a neighborhood where there are feral cats, cats think that any soil is their own personal litter box, and you know we don't want that in our vegetable garden. Um, there are repellents that you can put down, um, granular type products that, that just smell bad with capsaicin in them. Um, you can try those. There are also um, these mats that you can buy. It's, um, they have like plastic spikes that stick up from them and it's a mat and you lay it down and it has all these plastic, like a bed of nails sticking up. And it's not going to hurt the cats, but they aren't going to walk on it because they, they don't like the way it feels. So, you know, you could put those down in between rows to, to deter cats. Um, so that's, uh, I guess that's all the critters. And again, as far as other critters go, diseases or insect critters, um, contact us. We can give you ideas how to control it. Um, correct ID is very important. Just because you see an insect on a plant doesn't mean that insect is killing the plant. It could very well be a beneficial insect. Um, it could be a harmless insect. Um, so all insects are not bad. Um, we need to see what the problem is, whether it's an insect or, or a disease issue. And a lot of times with photographs, we can, we can tell what's going on. So in the past, we would have people bring in samples. Obviously, our office is not open now, but you can email me photos. If you can get a good photo of the problem, email it to me, and we will find a solution for you, whether, whether you choose to use pesticides or whether you want an organic solution, we can figure something out. Um, that's my email address. So anytime you have any issues, just send me a photograph. Um, harvest. So hopefully you've, you've done everything correctly. The weather has been great and you've got a good harvest. Um, you need to pay attention to ripeness. Timing is important. Um, a lot of times if you wait too long, the plants, the, the fruit is going to be of lower quality. Um, you can't really go buy the vegetables that we buy in the store because a lot of times they are harvested before they're ripe and they're ripened artificially or they are harvested when they are too large. Ideally, zucchini should be harvested when it's about six inches long, max. What do we see in the store? We see ones that are a lot bigger than that. Um, so you can't really go by that. Um, and have a plan, you know, if you, if you got a lot, if you have a lot of something, um, or you're growing a lot of something, you know, have a plan for either storage or preservation, or, you know, maybe you're just going to give it to, to the local food bank. At the end of the gardening season, um, pull out all dead plant material, any, de any debris from the soil, remove any stakes or trellising. Um, if you're adding fresh manure or leaves, you wanna put that in at the end of the season because that gives it all winter and part of spring to break down. You never wanna add either one of those in the spring because it will not have enough time to break down. So um, if you, you know, maybe you're, you've got some fresh cow or horse manure, fall is the time to add it. Um, and you should only be tilling one time per year, either in the spring or in the fall. Um, a lot of times we get our little machines and we become crazy and obsessive about, about using them. But if you use them too much, you can actually destroy your soil structure. And that is very, very difficult to repair. So make a plan only till once per year, either in the spring or the fall. This is our Cornell gardening site. Uh, if you go to this site and you click, out the tab, click on the tab that says garden guidance, um, go to food gardening, and then there will be a tab for vegetable growing guides. And it will give you all the information you could ever want on individual vegetables, how to plant them, how to maintain them, how to harvest them, how to take care of any disease or insect issues. 
So um, this is a good site to go to. And what's, what's so good about this is, is it's relevant to New York State. Um, you know, you can get online and read about pumpkins or read about tomatoes. But a lot of times it may be from California or maybe from Florida or Texas. Um, the information on the Cornell Gardening site is relevant to New York State. So it's going to be um, mo much more beneficial than from other sites. And again, there is my email address and my work phone number. Um, I'm not at the office, but I can check my voicemail. And um, if you have, you know, if you, if you can't send a, an email or you don't prefer to send an email, just call that number and leave me a message. So that's it for vegetables. Does anyone have any questions? We'll wait and see. Okay. We, Must have, be. we have someone said they accidentally planted six zucchini plants. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and that happens. You're going to have a lot of zucchini and your neighbors will be hiding from you. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things you can do with zucchini. There's a lot of relishes you can make. I tried actually freezing it one year and it was nasty. Um, you know, you can make zucchini bread. You can, can use it for a lot of different things. But, you know, a good option is a food bank, too, if you have excess. Let's see. It says Elba. Elba Diaz has a raised hand. So maybe we can unmute. Let me see if I can. Maybe I have to do this. I think they can. Um, someone said, you mentioned using black plastic for several vegetables, melons. Is there any issue with getting water to the base of the plant? You have to be very, that's a good question. You have to be targeted with your watering so it gets into the roots. Um, you need to buy the black plastic that has holes in it because then all the water, rainwater or whatever can penetrate through all of that plastic. Um, that's the best kind to use. If, if you can't find that, then you really need to be very targeted to make sure that water goes down to the base of the plant and penetrates underneath the plastic. Um, last week you mentioned hanging baskets needed watered more than once a day. I've been watering my baskets before 10 a.m., but what time should I water for the second time in the day? Well, I would say, you know, we, we tell people not to water late in the day, but with baskets, you almost have to, especially when you have those 80 degree temperatures and they're hanging up there in the wind. And I would say, you know, when the soil feels dry or the plant starts to wilt, just give it, give it some more water. Usually with hanging baskets, you can get a watering can in there and you can water at the, at the soil level. And if you can do that and avoid getting it wet, it's, it's not going to create any problems. She says, thank you. Okay, good. All right, so while we're waiting to see if anybody else um, has any questions, next week will be our last um, <laughs> program on gardening. After that, um, Hannah from our nutrition department is going to be on um, giving you guys ideas on how to, um, how to cook with any crops that you are harvesting. So next week, I'm just going to be on, I'm going to sign on, and I'm just going to be there to answer your questions. We will, we will let everybody have their video on, we'll unmute everybody, and you can just go ahead and ask me your questions. You know, by that time, your, your gardening should be pretty well underway, and you may be some, seeing some things that, are, that you have a concern about. So we'll just have a Q&A session, and that'll include vegetables, trees, shrubs, flowers, lawns, whatever questions you might have. Um, can I mix mint and peppermint in the same pot? Yes, you can. Yep. You don't want to put those in the garden, though, because they, they will spread like crazy. Putting them in a pot is a great idea.
Um, how tall should my pots be to grow tomatoes? Tomatoes grow best in something the size of a five gallon bucket. So think of the size of a five gallon bucket. So anything you can find like that, that you can put holes in the bottom of. Um, if you can't find anything that large, try to buy patio tomatoes. Patio tomatoes are bred to stay small and you can put those in pots that are slightly smaller. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions. Um, she just asked one more. Should yes. I water my plants if I know it's gonna rain later that day? No, if you know it's gonna rain, don't, don't bother watering. You're just wasting water. And you know, you can, you can, it's very easy to overwater. So you gotta, you know, that's another reason why we say, you know, be aware of the weather, watch the weather, know what's gonna happen. If it's gonna rain, don't bother watering. Um, two more. How deep should my raised bed be for vegetables? For vegetables, I would say the minimum depth is going to be about eight inches. Uh, someone commented, thank you so much. Awesome class. Thank you for doing this for us. Well, you're certainly welcome. You're welcome. And keep, and keep in mind that email address if you have questions. And another thing is, this sometimes confuses people. It's S-J-G. When they underlined it, you, you can't really tell that that's a, that's a J. A lot of people think it's an I, and um, that obviously will get bounced back to you, but it's S-J-G-42. Okay, folks. Well, I think okay. it sounds like we've got everybody, all the questions answered for today. We hope you tune in next Monday at the same time, 10 o'clock. And we will just be there to answer all of your questions. Thank you to Jenna for taking care of the chat for us. And um, we'll see everybody next week. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Bye, Sue. Bye, Jenna.